hello 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 you guys this is your girl Najwa thank you for being back to my channel today I want to talk about Netflix's African Queen Jenga oh my god I know I start like every video like that <laughs> but seriously oh my god it is so 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 good um basically it is about the very first female queen female king um of Africa who was recognized by the Catholic Roman state um, as an actual monarch, okay? And it, this is based in the 1600s. It was produced by Jada Pinkett Smith, <laughs> which, okay, I'm gonna show this meme from Jada Pinkett Smith. I'm gonna get into why I feel like this is funny and why it's all related, but um, yeah. And we know that Chris Rock came after our girl, Meghan Markle, so we don't like him so much, but I feel like um, African people and people of African ancestry, because of the diaspora, have faced so much ancestral trauma that many people don't even take the chance to try to understand. Um, and this show really shows that there was an entire life that existed before colonizers entered into Africa, taking men and women brutally oftentimes. Um, so it follows the life of Njinga, and this is in uh, what is now mod modern-day Angola, um, but then it was called Ndongo um, in Southwest Africa. And um, it basically follows this fight with tooth and nail with Njinga trying to get the Portuguese out of her ancestral home. Um, she's the princess, she's the daughter of a king, and, um, yeah, I'm gonna go through basically the storyline with you, I'm gonna talk about what I thought, I'm gonna tell you about why you need to, I'm gonna try and make this as short as I can, because seriously, you need to turn off this video and go and watch it. Um, but before I get into it, basically, many of you who follow my channel pretty regularly, you know that my husband is Portuguese, and, um, you know, when we first started preparing to get married and everything, we wanted to see a marriage counselor so that we could basically always come from a foundation of love, healthy love, um, especially with coming from different cultures, different backgrounds. I mean, we met here in Paris. It's a beautiful love story, but what people don't tell you about outside of the world romance, you know, even coming from two different, you know, socioeconomic statuses or two different personality types, you know, add in different cultures, being from different countries, that's a whole nother level. So we really, really wanted to navigate that correctly. Or not, I won't even say correctly, I will say healthily. And so our marriage counselor, you know, is a French woman, but she's Jamaican and she is like, she is, no, she is, she does not play, okay? She is, she's like, she's really to the point, um, she's no nonsense and she, tells us from a perspective um, really that I think just it's, it, it comes from this deep human place and she one time told us I don't know if it was with one of my individual sessions with her or if it was um, with the both of us but she basically said you know you might need to address some of your ancestral pain and maybe some ancestral anger that you have towards him and I was just like, what are you talking about? I was like, I'm open-minded, I'm progressive, like, we didn't marriage each other for, uh, you know, our colors, our skin colors, anything like that. Um, we just married each other for the person, and she was like, yeah, she's like, you've got, she's like, black people, whether you know it or not, you know, you might hold some ancestral trauma or resentment towards him. And I don't know that I'll break it down as simple as that, but looking at this show, you know, I really, really get it. And I've talked to my mom before, and she's been like, you know what, you and Pedro, you guys, like, prove that, you know, there is good in the world. Not to toot my own horn or anything. I mean, I don't think that we deserve a Nobel Peace Prize for marrying someone outside of our race, but um, she basically, my mom basically said, like, you know, the world is changing and a lot of people are resistance to, resistant towards that change. And, you know, she was basically saying, people like us, we're the kind of people who break down barriers. And now that I can understand because watching this show, which my husband and I, we watch a lot of shows like this, to be honest, because 
we can't ever let go of that fact that, you know, there is a history to where we are, to what makes our love so profound today. Um, and so basically, and Jenga starts in the 1600s. Now, I got some notes here, so if I'm looking down a lot, I'm sorry. Um, but first, before we get into this, we know that this show is about the brutal enslavement of Angolan people by the Portuguese, um, and it follows the life of the Queen in Jenga. But before I really go completely into that, I want to just bring you a little bit to the biblical stance, because I look at stuff like this, and me being Catholic, you know, I definitely have mixed feelings about this. You know, and, and it takes a whole lifetime of just resolving oneself with this, which, you know, to look at the things that are happening with Harry and Meghan, with so many people out there who are racist, who are xenophobic, and they don't even know it. They don't even know that that ancestral code to just divide and conquer is even in them. You know, to just try and ignore this stuff is not going to solve anything. You know, you have to look at it head on. So, um... I was looking, and, and, and I don't know if I told you guys, so my, my name, you know, Najwa, I had told you guys I came from basically generations of Christians, but my parents, they were like, uh-uh, switch it up. <laughs> they were like uh, into Malcolm X and black love, black power and all that stuff, so they it converted to Islam in the 70s, and all of me and my, all of my siblings have Islamic names. We all have Muslim names. So my name is Najwa, I have a brother named Hakeem, and I have a sister named Ashanti after the Ashanti tribe. And <laughs> my sister Ashanti is five years older than me, and she's a little bit more ghetto. Um, <laughs> but she is amazing, she is a powerful, amazing mama and wife, and um, she's just always been this little spitfire, like her whole life. Her namesake is so appropriate. I, I'll tell you a story. When she um, was in high school, she was working at the bowling alley, uh, you know, on the weekends or, you know, after school or whatever, as a little side job. And uh, this guy was getting into a fight with her. First of all, who gets into a fight with a teenage employee at a bowling alley anyway? So you think she's going to be meek and stuff? She threw a bowling shoe at his face. <laughs> That's just the type of person she is, you know. But anyway, um, so first, thinking about them storming into Africa, taking all these people out, taking them as slaves, really watch the show because I can't even do it justice how barbaric this is. You know, these early colonizers and, and, and imperialists t called these people barbarians. They called my ancestors barbarians. But the way that they infiltrated these people's villages and homes, raped their women, pillaged through their countries, killed, these are the real barbarians. But they, they came in and twisted scripture, saying that this was validated by the Bible. And I'm sorry if you guys hear my husband cooking in the background. But how can you imagine that? Can you imagine that someone using the word of God to justify greed because at the end of the day that's really what it was it was about greed so I'm gonna read you a quote um, from Desmond Tutu so Desmond Tutu once said when missionaries came to Africa they had the Bible and we had land they said let us pray we closed our eyes when we opened them we had the Bible and they had the land Oh my god it's too, it's too good too too it's too good um the catholic church's involvement in the slave trade is very very dubious and being a part of the catholic church today we know that there is um shame you know we know that there's shame about that if there's no there's there's no question but i think that pride and ancestral pride and and patriotic pride goes so so deep that many times it's not discussed as literally and intentionally as it should be but I think as a Catholic myself who I'm not going to abandon my faith at all because these people took the words of the Lord they took the words of God and they twisted it to their own advantage it had absolutely nothing to do with the Bible or anything like that 
Now, I'm sure that there are plenty of people who are grateful that, you know, the Word of God, the Bible was able to come, but the means for it to get there is very, very questionable. So let's just think about this, what the Bible says. The Bible says, it does talk about respecting one's master. Um, there is parts of the Bible that talks about respecting one's master. But I really don't think that the Bible is speaking about a master in terms of a whoosh, whoosh, slave master. And the proof of that is the fact that one of Jesus' hugest missions is to get the Jews out of Egypt. So we know that slavery is probably, the, our modern day definition of slavery is probably a no-no in the eyes of Jesus. Okay? But Jesus also talks about loving one's neighbor. I don't think that the definition of loving one's neighbor is infiltrating and penetrating one's village for centuries, pillaging their, their home, their resources, their lands, their women, their children, killing their men, uh, stuffing the chattel slavery, stuffing them on ships. I don't think that that is Jesus's definition of love your neighbor. And even in terms today of, you know, um, I don't think that Jesus would be okay with that either, but I think respect. Um, so there's also, um, where Jesus says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. So of course we know the scene in the Bible where these men are about to stone a woman to death. And Jesus says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And before you know it, the only people there is Jesus and the woman because these people are not without sin. So hypocrisy, you know, this anger, this violence, this hate, no good. It was greed, you know. Luke chapter 12 basically tells us about, you know, greed, how greed is a huge, um, it holds us back from the kingdom of God. It holds us back from our truest selves. Now, if you want to go and do something and... You're passionate about it. You love doing it, and it helps other people. It helps you. It helps your family. And you are not harming anyone. You're not hurting anyone. And you're making profit off of that. Okay. You know, if you're not, you know, totally greedy with that profit, okay. Nobody expects anyone to, you know, not eat, not be able to provide themselves, not be able to do the things that, you know, bring them well-being. But... Greed is what drove these colonizers. So, basically, uh, we start in the, the, the early 1600s, okay? And the actress, her name is Adesua, Ades, Adesua Oni. Adesua Oni. And she's Nigerian and British, and oh my god. I mean, I followed her on Instagram, I stopped her on Google a little bit, because she is badass. I mean, she freaking killed this role. I mean, it was made for her. She did such a good job. Um, and then there's, since it's produced by Jada Pinkett Smith, you know, my husband looked at it, he's like, um, I'm pretty sure they didn't speak English in Angola. <laughs> and I mean, he's right. It's, it's produced by, you know, Jada Pinkett Smith, who's American. So, and, and most of the actors that I saw on the show seemed British, you know. Um, but I think that was a... Um, I think that was a move, not necessarily because of anything like sinister or anything like that. There's even pe historians, you know, there's pa Portuguese historians who speak in the show. I just think that Netflix's audience is probably more English speaking than Portuguese speaking. And I think that's why it ended up being in English. But, um, you know, anyway, that doesn't defeat the purpose, the, the purpose and what's spoken about in this documentary, docu-series, however you want to call it, because it is dramatized, you know, they're actors and they're acting at the scenes, but you also have historians making commentary, so it is amazing. Okay, so um, something that I just know is deeply embedded within me as someone who is a result of the African diaspora, you know, like ever since I was young, right now I'm attempting to write a fiction book. I don't, I mean, I understand why it took J.K. Rowling six years to write Harry Potter because um, it's kind of crazy, but I've been having these dreams since I was a kid of like 
living in this little tree village. I don't know even how to describe it, but there's there's this whole kingdom and it's made up of trees, you know, like in the trees and things like that. So I've been writing that and um, I really feel like that's coming from some sort of ancestral roots. I, I feel like even at these, you know, at this moment in this polarized world where we live in, you know, whenever, even as an African American, whenever I eat, meet a, a sister or a brother from Congo, from Ivory Coast, from Cameroon, from, you know, um, Togo, you know, like there's this immediate connection. And so I definitely think that there's, there's something in that, these dreams. And so basically, um, it starts out, and I, I yeah, I, this is also something I wanted to mention. I hope, I'm sorry I'm all over the place. It's not just the Western world that colonized people. It's not just, you know, people with pale skin who practice slavery, who practice um, brutality. You know, that existed in Africa before. I get to a certain extent, but not to any type of massive scale that it existed with the colonizers. And um, I do think back to um, Empress Key, if you guys have ever seen that show. It's about doing the uh, Josuin. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it, but it's like in Korea, the Josuin dy dynasty. And um, China had a really strong hand on Korea. At, I mean, at some point in history, a lot throughout history, and probably still to this day, you know, Korea was definitely colonized and imperialized by China to a certain extent. And so we see throughout the world that it's not just Europe that's doing it. You know, it, it, you know, slavery and things like that happen in Africa to a certain extent as well. But none of it ever to this massive, brutal scale, like with the transatlantic trade uh, system, which went on for like 300 years. You know, and my husband likes to say, oh, well, the Portuguese were the first to start it, but they were also the first to get out of it. Well, you know, um, there's this part at the end of the, the series where they basically say, um, they, oh, God. Also, the Queen of Congo is one of the, the historians or one of the people. She's one of the people who makes commentary on the show, and she is amazing. But she basically says, like, no one can go on for so long without, no warrior can go for forever without eventually casting aside his sword, you know? So that says everything. But... Um, very quickly, I'm going to just, I basically already told you what I think of it, but very quickly I'm going to go through the plot and tell you what it's about, and uh, then I'll tell you my final thoughts. So, like I said, it starts in the 1600s. Um, basically, you see uh, Njinga, and she is basically learning from her dad, she's learning from her brothers, and her brothers are constantly bickering at each other, and you see there's, this, she has two sisters, um, and one is Fungi and one is, um, 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 Kumba, Kambu, Kambu, sorry. And basically you see this loving relationship with she and her sisters. You see this very tense relationship with she and her brothers because from a very young age, she shows, uh, a military leader abilities, right? And her, she has this one brother who is a half-brother, actually. And so he's not necessarily... I mean, the way that the succession of kings worked in this particular tribe of Africa was a little bit different than the way it might work with, like, the Dutch monarchy or the British monarchy. It was like nobody was necessarily in line for um, the crown. Um, but those who were, like, a direct bloodline of the recognized king and his reigning uh, queen were like more inclined to take on that line and so she had a brother who basically was from some you know a, a side piece I guess if you want to say and so he basically was consumed by power from the very beginning so there you see right there that it's not just you know people from 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 Europe who have been consumed by power and greed that exists but Remember, remind you, this is taking place after the Portuguese have already started to infiltrate into Ndongo or Angola. So, um, basically, somebody, um, the, the, the king, you know, Njinga's father is 
trying to figure out what to do about the Portuguese. But at the same time, he's in a tough place. He doesn't want to pounce, you know, just completely directly, but at the same time, he knows that it's a growing problem and he knows that something needs to be done about it. He just fears that he doesn't really have the resources to approach it the best way that he needs to. And so there's a little bit of hesitation there. And the brother who's all pumped up on power and crazy, he's like, let's just go out of the bloody Portuguese. Da, 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 da. You know, and all of a sudden, the king mysteriously is murdered. We don't know who murdered him, but I feel like we can assume it was probably the crazy brother because he was basically making way for himself to become king and he does become king. Um, so his name is Mbandi. And Mbandi kills Najinga's son. She, he kills his sister's baby child, an infant, like not even a seven-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 19-year-old, like a baby baby. He kills him because he feels like if he can eliminate any of the, the, the threats to the throne, he's going to do it, you know? And so to look at just how... The, the colonizers came in and how this affected people because Njinga also does a lot of things that she probably really, really would regret by the end of her life to get the Portuguese out of her village, to protect her people, um, to, to um, have her name recognized. And so it's not, it's not wonderful. So Mbondi kills Njinga's son, okay, and then... Um, <laughs> I thought it was really funny because when he does that, she's in bed and the next thing you know, she's with her sisters and she's with the spiritual guide and the spiritual guide is really curious because you know what, I'm not going to say, but I, I had some wonderings about if the spiritual guide was maybe not trustworthy or something. So when you're watching, you guys can let me know what you think. But, um, the, the spiritual guide is basically giving her this sedative to make her just sleep, you know? And so Najinga's like, after her, after her son is killed by her half-brother, her first words are, Get. Me. My battle axe. <laughs> I'm like, I know, that's right, girl. Um, anyway, so, the Portuguese are there, there, it's, it's just like exponentially growing, you know, this problem. You know, the way that when when someone speaks out against xenophobia or racism or anything that the internet deems as you know social justice warrior or whatever how this just it's like a cancer it just exponentially grows you know the the crazy comments from all the hateful trolls and stuff that's basically how the portuguese coming into indogo like capturing and killing and enslaving people that's how it's it's, it's just growing at an exponential rate and it's becoming more and more and more and more of a problem and it's getting quite scary. So um, basically, at this point, Mbondi, you know, let's just let's skip forward a couple of years, whatever. Mbondi, the crazy brother who was all pumped up on greed, he has become king, but he's killed his father, he's killed his nephew, and he is in deep, deep depression, as he should be. At, at this point, he's wondering, hmm, the things that I've done to get along the way to this, the things that I've done to get to this point that I am, were they really worth it? So, basically, uh, Njinga becomes the, the reigning monarch, okay? And she becomes um, a female king, uh, at, while before she was a regent and Casa, this guy, um, he was pretty hot. <laughs> but um, Casa is a part of the how do you say it? Imba, um, Imbangala, Imbangala, yeah, Imbangala. So the Imbangala are these mercenaries, and they have as many troops as twenty thousand to eighty thousand men at their disposal. They will work for the Portuguese. They will work for. Um, you know, the actual monarch of the uh, Indogo land, um, they'll, they'll, they'll basically do anything for the right price, you know. And so, basically, throughout the show, um, Njinga seeks out the Imbangala to get their help. So, the main person who um, Njinga is going head-to-head -head with in the beginning from Portugal is someone called 
for now the susa baby baby yeah have you ever heard of someone called for now the susa maybe <laughs> maybe what about someone called um soto mayor Oh. Well, so there's someone named Fernando Sosa, and he is basically the main Portuguese general, and he is going head to head to Njinga. He's really, really condescending. <laughs> like, but what else would you expect at this point? Like, there's this point where she goes to negotiate with him, and in the beginning, Njinga is naive enough to think that she can negotiate peace with the Portuguese. So when you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, oh, the African people, they came from a place of peace and initially, you know, except that's very true. Initially, they just wanted peace, you know, and he showed very early on that that was not um, going to happen because there's a scene where she arrives at his court and he sits down, but he doesn't offer her a chair. And so I'm not going to tell you what she does at that point. You just need to go watch the show. But she does the most badass move ever. Okay. So Njinga is going head to head with um, D'Souza. And um, basically, the, the thing is, is what's so sinister about it is that these people are using the Bible to justify their greed. So they're saying, we're coming here to convert you, to rid you of your barbarianism, to rid you of your paganism. You know, that's something you hear a lot throughout the show, your paganism. So basically, what Njinga says is, you know what, I think what I need to do to really have um, an advantage here is to be baptized. And so Njinga becomes baptized. But... Um, for me, it seems like it's much more of a political move to her, for her. I don't think that she is really completely buying into the Christian faith. But I don't know. Who knows? You know, who knows? So basically, they come to a, a compromise for time, but there's still chattel slavery happening. And chattel slavery, as the historian on the show explains, is when they really don't care about anything. It's just about quantity, about cramming as many bodies as you can in a ship and if you think about that I mean you can imagine those conditions you can imagine lots of feces and vomit and lots of bodily fluids and um, illnesses and death I mean I can't I can't, can't I cannot even imagine what my ancestors had to go through and I told you guys that my family did our ancestry and our family comes from Ghana but you know to me, it's all of our ancestors. Like, the cradle of civilization comes from Africa. So the fact that you could do this to your original motherland, it's just like... But I, come, I have my conclusion for that at the end. So basically, this is just this cat and mouse game going for a while. And um, Mbande, Mbandi, who is the king at this point, he's starting to question his decisions, the, the crazy brother or whatever. He's got depression, and so he dies most likely by suicide. It seems like by suicide, but who knows? It could have also, she could have also killed him. Who knows? Um, that right there is, is the proof that we have choices in life. You know, when you have descended so deeply into sin, you know, and, and if, even if you're not a religious person, even if you want to call it um, into demons, into vices, you know, Sometimes you, you feel like you've dug yourself so deep that you can't pull yourself out. But you always have a choice and you always can pull yourself out. And I think that Mbandi, the crazy brother of uh, uh, Njinga, I think that he had just saw no other choice. He had saw all of this sin that he had done and so he took his own life. But I don't know. She also could have killed him. I mean, he killed her baby, so... So then, um, Kasa, the guy who I said was pretty hot... <laughs> Um, he marries, Njing, well, Njinga marries Kasa, and he's from the, how do you call it again, M Mba, uh, Mbaga, Mbalaga, Mbalaga, Kasa's from the Mbalaga, the mercenary group, and, um, that is really just a political move, kinda to get closer to her nephew, who is the son of Mbandi, the guy who killed himself, and she, in Njinga actually kills her own nephew, I think for similar reasons that, um, 
and Bondi killed her son, which was kind of to eliminate him from the picture to make sure that she was the one and only queen of Indogo. So, um, yes, the way one of the first ways that you know Injinga bands with the um, the Imbalaga to sort of stop the Portuguese or uh, impede their 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 slave practices and, and capturing slaves is to block off the roads. So um, the Portuguese really don't like this. <laughs> You know, they say that it's about coming to convert them to Christianity, but we know it's really about human labor. We know it's about slaves. We know it's about the resources. So they really, really don't like this. And so they basically enact war against Njinga and her people. Most of her soldiers are killed. They capture her two sisters, her baby sister Fungi and her other sister uh, Kumba. Um, why do I keep... Kambu. Why do I keep doing that? I keep inversing it. Kambu. Kambu, Kambu. And, um, yeah. So then another person from their, from their, um, from the uh, Indogo people, sort of a, a diplomat, if you want to say, his name was Mwene Lumbu, uh, uh, Njinga sends him basically to advocate for peace. And, yes. Again, here we go with the peace, and they basically kick his butt. So every time that they tried to go from a level of peace to the people who are ravaging their lands, they basically get um, violated. So basically, desperation, she has desperation. Um, she doesn't want any more of her people to take, uh, she doesn't want any more, more of her people taken. So, um, Njinga agrees to marry, um, K Kasinje, Kasanji, and Kasanji is also a part of the Imba, Imba, Imbalaga, I'm sorry, I have such a problem pronouncing these names, but, um, basically he's one of the mercenaries and he's brutal, you know, they practice cannibalism and, but she knows that he has at his disposal at least 80,000 men, so it's really like a power move and she just sees it as what she needs to do to protect her people. So, um, yeah, he's like, if you're going to do this, I have two conditions. You're going to have to marry me. The second condition is you're going to have to release all of your symbols that show that you're a queen. And he's like, you're going to have to take the blood oath. Um, so they have this alliance. Now Njinga has over 100,000 soldiers. And then after four years, her baby sister, Fungi is still held hostage. Um, and her sister... Kambu is also still held hostage. So by... Oh, and also Fungi is acting as a spy for Inja. So by 1641, France, Britain, all the big guns, um, especially the biggest big gun, the Dutch, have already started to infiltrate uh, Indongo also. And so basically Njinga says, hmm, I'm going to work with the Dutch because we know that the Dutch doesn't like the Portuguese. I'm going to work with the Dutch so that they can eliminate the Portuguese. So, <laughs> you can imagine at this point, uh, the Portuguese king is not happy. So basically, they pull for now the, the, the Sosa, the Sousa, out, and they put in um, um, Soto Mayor. So... When the Portuguese people find out that Najinga's little sister is spying on them, they're furious and they almost kill her. Um, at least, I, I, you know, I was, and I was a little confused on this one. I'm really not sure, like, it seems like, you guys can let me know, because it seems like they kill her, but later on she comes back. Like, she's reunited with her sister, so I don't know if that was really to just scare Njinga and they actually didn't kill her, but... Um, that was a little bizarre, but they, they attempt to drown her or they do drown her. So, um, Njinga is like, okay, listen, I want my sisters back. I want the Portuguese people out and I want to be recognized as a female king, uh, in the face of the, the Roman Catholic church. She's like, that's what I want because she is making it really, really hard for the Portuguese. So she actually is in a place, an advantageous place to make demands, even though they don't want to meet her demands very quickly. 
So after about four years, you know, she builds 100 or 200 churches, you know, in the now Angola area. And uh, they perform a certain amount of rituals and baptisms and offerings. Uh, she has to offer 200 slaves, which she really is not happy about. But at this point, you know, it's the, the slave trade has exploded beyond her control. You know, it was beyond her father's control at this point, but it is out of her control. And we know that it was basically out of control at that point. And there was not much that the African peoples could do. So they send back one of her sisters, but they don't recognize her as queen, of course. So, um, five years later, she's reunited with her other sister, and then they finally recognize her as an African Christian queen, a queen of an African Christian state. That's the way that they phrased it. And she is the only uh, black queen to ever get that title or status. So, <laughs> by the end of her life, the slave trade had basically exploded. Um... Even though I gave you that short synopsis, please, please, please go and watch it. Um, you know, my, my conclusion. So this is, this is my conclusion. The word of Jesus was delivered around the world at a very, very high price to everyone, to everyone. And those with African ancestry or those with sympathies for those who have been a part of the African diaspora, you may think that the hugest sufferer in this case has been those Africans who lost their lives um, and today's people of African descent. But the way that I view it and the conclusion that I've come to is that everyone has suffered, including the colonizers. Let me tell you why. So Africans paid in the price of human lives. We paid in the price of human lives and centuries and centuries of ancestral trauma and land and resources. That's how we paid. But the brutal colonizers, this is what I wrote down in my notes, the brutal colonizers will have to answer to the same power whose words they twisted. So yep, yeah, that's where I'm going to leave it. You guys let me know what you think in the comments. Please, please go watch African Queens uh, in Jenga. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do me a favor. If you have not already, click the like and subscribe button. Click the bell so you always know whenever I post a video. And I'll see you in the next one. Okay.